Well, last night we raised a ruckus, and that's what I like to do. I can't be quiet, and I'm not apologizing. So we're going to kind of dovetail off of that. Um, as Brother David said, we, uh, we saw two souls enter the kingdom last night, and that's what we're going to talk about today. We talked about no condemnation, and we have basically unofficially declared this is <clears throat> Freedom Weekend because Brother David said last night that this is Fourth of July weekend, and so we're just going to call it Freedom. And I believe that we're going to hear some testimonies in the not-too-distant future of the freedom. I believe that we saw some restoration. I believe we saw some chains broken last night. So it was a fantastic evening that we had last night. So anyway, we're going to get started here. So how about Hebrews chapter 4? Hebrews chapter 4, we're going to look at verses 9 through 11. This is going to be our text scripture. Hebrews chapter 9. I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. While you're turning there, I'm going to tell you how I got this. Um, if the Lord gives me things directly through dreams or just words, um, I like to share them because I want to promote the Holy Spirit giving you the word and not just scattering through the Bible to find a message, because I don't do that. I let the Holy Spirit speak to me. And being an evangelist, I often ask God, what do you want to say to the church? And so, late last year, I was sitting in my office in my home, and I asked the Lord, I said, okay, I preached this year what you want me to preach, 2023 it was. And he said, my church needs a little R&R. &R. So my first thought was, okay, rest and relaxation. He's like, no, it's not. I'm like, okay, well, of course I'm wrong. He said, my church needs a little R&R. &R. And I said, all right, Lord, can you expound on that? Explain it to me. He said, my church needs to learn how to rest and receive. The church needs to learn how to rest and receive and we're going to be talking about the kingdom of God see last night the kingdom was on display in full force it was kingdom operation the whole evening two souls born again into the kingdom of God by their own confession somebody received a fresh infilling of the baptism of the Holy Spirit last night I mean it was it was a good service so the Lord spoke to me to put a message together on the R&R &R he was talking about, resting and receiving. And I told Miss Pam today that the, the name of the message is rest because I didn't want to have a long, drawn-out title for her to type out. So I, it's entering into that rest is the original name of the message. Entering into that rest, but rest is fine because it's all the same. And so, if you're in Hebrews chapter 4, we're going to get started, and we're going to look at verses 9 through 11. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 through 11 says this, There remaineth therefore a rest for the people of God. Who in here are people of God? If you're not, we can fix it. That happened last night. There remaineth therefore a rest for the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall to the same example of unbelief. Now, we're going to break that scripture down because there's a lot of questions in that passage. There's a lot of questions. So we're, we're going to look at some of the questions and with the remaining scripture that I have typed out here on these two pieces of paper, we're going to answer those questions. And so let's look at it again. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Well, we know that we're people of God. So there is a rest for us. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is, in there, that is entered into his rest, he has also ceased from his own works. Who is he? Well, the first question is simple. That would be we. That's the answer to that. 
for he that has entered into his rest, he has also ceased from his own works, as who? As God did from his. God ceased at some point from his own works. And then it says, let us labor. What kind of labor? Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. That rest. Not just any rest. That rest. What rest? To figure that out. And so we got a lot of questions to answer in this little passage of Scripture here. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall to the same example of unbelief. What is that same example? Again, we've got a lot of questions. And so I want to take you to a point that I want to make before we get started on our journey today. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 44 to 46, Paul is talking to the Corinthians because they're discouraged about people who die. And he's trying to bring them comfort. Did they die in Christ? He's trying to bring them comfort. And he talks about the first Adam, and he talks about the second Adam. And one statement he makes is something that I want to <clears throat> bring out right here so that while we're going through this, we can really sink our teeth in and learn something very, very valuable. He says the first Adam was of the earth, and the last Adam was of the spirit. The first Adam was of the earth, and the last Adam was of the spirit. Then he said, natural to spiritual. That is a huge principle and in interpretation of the word of God. Natural to spiritual. So if I'm able to do so, which I should be every time, we're going to start in the old covenant. Why? Because that is where the best place to start to prove your point is. In the Old Covenant. We go Old Covenant to New Covenant. I like everything simple, as I said last night. I don't like anything complicated. I want it A, B, C, 1, 2, 3. I want it line upon line, precept upon precept. That's how I preach to people. Because I want everybody to get what we're talking about. I don't want anybody left behind. And so the first scripture in the Old Covenant that we're going to look at is Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 through 11. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 through 11. We're talking about that rest that we're supposed to enter into. I'm going to read the scripture, then I'm going to give you a backstory to help us better understand what's going on. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 through 11. And it says this, remember the Sabbath, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger that is within the gate, nor your stranger that is within the gate. For in six days... The Lord hath created the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that in them is and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. What does hallowed mean? He set it apart and he made it holy. But before we get into this, let's have a little backstory. Okay, Moses has just brought the children of Israel out of Egypt where they were slaves for 430 years. Okay, that's a long time to have somebody telling you what to do with a whip at your back. It got so bad that they not only had to make bricks, but they had to make their own straw to make the bricks. So Moses is chosen by God to lead the children, lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. And how many know that you can get the people out of Egypt, but you have a hard time getting the Egypt out of the people? You can say the same thing with religion. 
Sometimes you can deliver people from the place where the religion is, but it's hard to get the religion out of the people. That's basically what happened here. So, I believe this is the sixth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And then he gives, you know, the instructions on the, of the Sabbath day and what to do and what not to do. And so Moses delivers the children of Israel out of Egypt and they murmur and they complain and they're hungry and, you know, this is happening and that's happening. You know, they see miracles from God and they clap and then 10 minutes later they're hungry again. That's why they're called the children of Israel. Because they act like kids. And so Moses goes up to Mount Sinai and God gives him the law, which we know is the Ten Commandments. We can call it ten principles, ten promises, ten rules to live by. You know, the Ten Commandments are good. Everything God created was good. It was meant for good. So God gives Moses the Ten Commandments for the children of Israel, and in it, there's the Sabbath day. Well, what is the Sabbath day for? The Sabbath day is for rest. But remember what covenant we're in. Remember the covenant. It's not the new covenant, it's the old covenant. So he gives them a day of, God gives them a day of rest. Why? Because they didn't have any in Egypt. They were slaves and they were made to work constantly. They didn't know what rest was. And so God gives them a break. He gives them a day of rest and he says, look, you're not going to work. And neither are the strangers in the gates, neither are any of your family, and neither are your cattle. So what they did was on the day before the Sabbath, they collected enough food for the two days that would feed them until the week started over. So this is something the Lord showed me about the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are rules to live by, but they are the kingdom before the kingdom was cool. See, the, the thing was that Moses was told to, lead, to deliver, uh, lead them to the promised land. Deliver them from Egypt, get them to the promised land. The promised land journey was supposed to be 11 days. It took 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Why? But because of murmuring and complaining, that generation had to die. And a remnant was the only, the only group of people to be able to go into the promised land. A remnant. Not the whole group of people, a small portion of people. Why? Because they believe God. But the Lord showed me this in the midst of me preaching this. He said, this is a picture of the kingdom. The Ten Commandments were a discipline and a new way of life. See, all the children of Israel knew was the life that they had been living. Imagine if you lived to be 600 years old. Now, that's a lot of life. Just ask Methuselah. He was 969. That's a lot of life. Imagine if you lived to be 600 years old. And 430 years of that, you were a slave. And then you come out, and you don't know what else to do. Okay, how about this? It's like being in prison. And you're in prison for 430 years of that 600 years. You're not going to know what to do when you get out. They didn't know what to do when they got out because they had been so ingrained with the life that they had lived that they didn't know any different. So what did God do? God called a man to deliver them, and he had to give them a new way of life and a new discipline. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other, you should not make any graven images and go down the list of the Ten Commandments. Don't steal, don't murder, don't lie, don't covet your neighbor's wife or their stuff. Don't bear false witness against your neighbor. So Moses got these ten principles 
or ten ways of life. But the Lord showed me this is a preparation for the promised land. This is not something to get them in trouble. This is something to help them on their journey to the next place that God has for them. The law was good. The law was not bad. The law was made so people could walk a straight line. But the Lord showed me that this is the kingdom in the Old Covenant. Old Covenant kingdom. So what is this? This is what's called a type and shadow. Let's go to Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Colossians 2, verses 16 and 17. Remember these scriptures. We just covered, we just covered the thing about the sixth commandment, the Sabbath day. Remember to keep it holy, and it was hallowed. It was set apart. Colossians 2, verses 16 and 17. It says this, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink, or in respect of a holy day, or of a new moon, or of a Sabbath day. For these are all shadows of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So what did we just learn? We just learned that the Sabbath is a type and a shadow. It's a shadow of things to come. What's coming? We'll get there. So let's talk about this a little bit. It says, let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink. There's another scripture in the Bible in Romans 14, 17 that says the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So there's two scriptures that talk about meat and drink. Let no man judge you in the physical. That's what that part is talking about. Let no man judge what you do in the physical nature. Let no man judge you, <clears throat> therefore, in meat or in drink, or in respect of a holy day, or of a new moon, or of the Sabbath days. They are all shadows of things to come. The old covenant is filled with types and shadows. Without types and shadows, we wouldn't have a new covenant. We would just be sticking with the old and trying our best to live up to what it says. The Sabbath was physical in Exodus, but it was a shadow of something greater. Let me give you an example of some types and shadows. Yesterday we talked about the sin of Adam and Eve. The first shadow picture in the Old Covenant was in Genesis. As soon as Eve ate the tree, sin came. Remember, we talked about that. And then she gave to her husband to eat. What happened there? Remember, Adam had dominion. The kingdom of God was placed inside of Adam. He didn't have a throne, but he did have a kingdom. His kingdom was the garden, and he was commanded to keep it and dress it. That was his only job. And to enjoy life, of course. He named the animals. God gave Adam dominion and he put the kingdom inside of him. He was born, so to speak, with the kingdom inside of him. And when he partook of the fruit that Eve shared with him, he gave up his dominion and his kingdom to the devil. He gave it up. The devil didn't take it away. He gave it up. What is that a picture of? Jesus leaving his Godship behind in heaven to give it up for his bride. That's the first picture in the Old Covenant. God had a plan from the very beginning. No man or the devil was going to destroy 
what God had planned. Praise God for that. Or we'd be in a lot of trouble. Another type of shadow, I might have mentioned this yesterday, were the fig leaves that were sown by Adam and Eve to make themselves aprons. That was another type of shadow. Why did they do that? Because of their shame. They wanted to hide their nakedness. The fig leaves represent the work of the old covenant. Do you realize the first work ever done was the sowing of the fig leaves? Sin produced work. Sin produced work. Before that, everything was available to Adam and Eve at their disposal in the garden. They had food, they had drink, they had everything they needed. So that's another type and shadow. So see, types and shadows are very important. God told his story from the very first scriptures. I'll tell you something else that doesn't exactly pertain, but it's kind of neat to know. The Bible says in Genesis 1 that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Did you know in the beginning is one word in the original language? You know what that word is? First fruits. Who is the first fruits? Jesus is the first fruit. Jesus, the word made flesh, the one that John chapter 1 says, all things were made by him and nothing that was made was not made by uh, was made by him. You know. Everything that was made was made by the word. And you can prove that by the first word in the Bible. The first fruits. Jesus is the first fruit and the firstborn. He was first. So types and shadows are extremely important in the journey that we're on. We'll read this one more time and we'll go on. It says, let no man judge you in meat or drink, the natural. Let no man judge you in meat or drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. For they are all shadows of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Types and shadows are one of my favorite things to study because that's how I figure out the New Testament. That's how Paul figured out the New Testament, or Paul figured out Jesus was the Son of God. He had to go to what he knew. Paul knew the law. The New Testament hadn't been written yet, but we know Paul wrote two-thirds of it. So we're talking about entering into that rest. And we see here in Colossians, the Bible says, Let no man judge you in the natural things. For they're all shadows of things to come. The new moons, the Sabbaths, everything is a type and shadow. In other words, it's there, but it's not really there. So we're fixing to see a transition here. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. Remember, we're going natural to spiritual in our talk today, natural to spiritual. We started out with the Sabbath day, found out that the original Sabbath day was a type and a shadow. It was good for the old covenant because they needed a day of rest. But we're going natural to spiritual, very important law in interpreting scripture. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 7 through 10 says this, For if that first covenant... The first covenant. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the day is come, said the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. Because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. 
pay attention to this. For this is the covenant that I will make in, make with Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind, and I will write them in their heart, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. There's a transition going on. See, everything was a type and shadow up until a certain point. Let me give you this piece of information, and it'll help you. From Genesis to the book of John, everything is Old Covenant. Jesus operated as a prophet under the Old Covenant. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John had to be Old Covenant. He operated as a prophet, as a prophet under the Old Covenant so he could fulfill the law. The new covenant starts in the book of Acts. When does the new covenant start? On the day of Pentecost. If you can't wrap biblical theology around the cross, the resurrection, and the day of Pentecost, we've got to try again. I call the three most important things in the scriptures, in history. Some people might say, what about the new birth? Jesus said to celebrate his death and resurrection. So we're going to look at this again. It says, for the, if the first covenant had been faultless. The first covenant was not faultless. The first covenant was the blood of bulls and goats and sacrificed once a year for the atonement of everybody's sin. There had to be a permanent sacrifice. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then had should no place been sought for the second one. I've heard people say, well, you know, it's all one book. There's only one covenant. There's two. It tells you right here in Hebrews chapter 8, there's two. I have had people tell me different, that there's one covenant and it's all the same. No, there was a changing of the guard. There was types and shadows, and then there was fulfillment of types and shadows. There was types and shadows and fulfillment of types and shadows. Here's a saying that you may have heard before. The old covenant concealed is the new covenant revealed. What is the revelation of the new covenant? It's Christ in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. If that don't make you shout, I don't know what will. There we go. Christ in you, the hope of glory. But it was said, it's said in the scriptures, that that is a mystery hid from ages and generations. God hid it so well that he hid it from the Jews, he hid it from the devil. He hid it from everybody. And when Jesus died on the cross and resurrected, when Jesus resurrected... That mystery was revealed. Christ in you. Then the day of Pentecost happened. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with him, he said, Behold, the day is come, said the Lord, well, I will make a new covenant. He was planning on making a new covenant. We went down through history with types and shadows to get to this. We're in a transition right now in our journey. What's the transition? Where the Lord spoke and he said, there's coming a day where I'm going to put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. They won't be on tablets of stone anymore. There's a change coming. There's a change coming. And he wanted them to be ready for that change. Paul was explaining, actually I think it's Paul that wrote Hebrews. I can't verify that, but I believe it is. But the writer of Hebrews will say that. 
the writer of Hebrews wanted them to know, the Hebrews to know, that there was a change. Galatians chapter 3, verses 24 to 26. Galatians 3, verses 24 to 26. Again, we're talking about entering into that rest. And at the end of this message, we're going to answer the questions that we have in the first, the first passage, which is Hebrews 4. So we're going to answer the questions with all of the, the studying and the looking at these scriptures that we're doing. Galatians chapter 3, verses 24 to 26. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. What was the law? The law was preparation for the promised land. It was kingdom before kingdom was cool. It was a new way of life for the people that had been in bondage. For the law was our schoolmaster to do what? To bring us to Christ that we might be justified by what? By faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Extremely important information. We're no longer under a schoolmaster, for ye are all children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Let's talk about this for just a minute. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster. To bring us to Christ. When I think about a schoolmaster, I think about three things. I think about discipline. Sometimes when we cut up in class, we I don't know if everybody in here did that when they were in school, but I did. I get myself in trouble. I cut up a lot. I saw the inside of the principal's office more than I like to talk about. A schoolmaster disciplines. What was the law? A, the law was a discipline. What else was the law? The law was a teacher. What did it teach? It taught a new way to live. What else was the law? And this might be hard to get, but we'll go through it. The law was exhortation. The law was exhortation. How was the law? The law was made for a man that didn't obey the law. It was not made for righteous people. Righteous people abided by the law. So the three things, it was a teacher, it was discipline, and it was exhortation. It taught you how to live. It disciplined you when you didn't do the right thing and exhorted you when you did do the right thing. What's the exhortation? You got to live. The law was good, but the law was temporary. What was the law for? To bring us unto Christ. The law was a preparation for us to get to Christ. We'll read it one more time. Wherefore the law, <clears throat> wherefore the law was our schoolmaster, but <clears throat> to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But when that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. What do I think about that? What do I think about when I hear that? I think of graduation. They graduated from the law to Christ. Everybody that became a child of God went from old covenant to new covenant. They graduated. You know, I know some people that I've talked to about high school before, and they're like, I couldn't wait to get out of there. They graduated. They graduated to a life in Christ and a life of freedom. They weren't under the law of sin and death anymore. Thy kingdom come. John the Baptist preached, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
And then Jesus came along and preached, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Look, the kingdom of heaven is not at hand anymore. We don't need to preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand anymore. The kingdom of heaven is here. Case in point, the two salvations that we had last night was a prompt display of the kingdom of heaven available. And two people partook in the kingdom of heaven, and now they're citizens of the kingdom. Now, they might not know a whole lot about that, but that'll change. Spiritual growth. We are all children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. What does it take to get there? It takes faith. Faith in what? Believing that Jesus Christ died and was resurrected and crowned king. On the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people were added to the church. The kingdom started growing on the day of Pentecost. Let's go to Matthew chapter 11, and we're going to look at verses 28 and 20, uh, uh, 29 and 30. Matthew 11, 29 and 30. I have 28 written here, so I have a tendency to default and go to it. But I'm looking at 29 and 30, and let's look at 29 and 30. Matthew chapter 11, verses 29 and 30. We have graduated into Christ and away from the law. The law was the teacher to get us to Christ. And now we're going to look at Matthew chapter 11, verses 29 and 30. And Jesus is talking, and he said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are of heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly at heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. Now, that rest is not physical. Remember, we already covered physical. We're now to the spiritual. We started that in this last scripture that we read. The law was written on their hearts and their minds. Come unto me, all you that are all you that labor and are of heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly at heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Here's a good question. Why is his yoke easy and his burden light? Because you're not the one carrying the load anymore. Do you realize in Matthew 23... Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees for making so many laws and putting burdens on people that they themselves wouldn't carry. That's the law he's, that is the law that we've been discussing. And here Jesus comes along and he's giving away something for free that's not even paid for. When did he pay for it? He paid for it at the cross and it was finalized at the resurrection. Jesus' whole ministry was the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Listen, at hand means near. He kept saying to the people, to the Jews, the gospel was promised to the Jew first, then to the Gentile. What did he say? He said, listen, the kingdom of heaven is nigh. It's coming. He was trying to get them ready. The kingdom of heaven is near. He said... Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly at heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. He's carrying the weight. The Bible says to cast your care on him, for he cares for you. That means you shouldn't care. Jesus purchased rest and, at the cross, but he gave it away before it was purchased. He was trying to get their minds in the right working order and thinking kingdom. Verse 
John chapter 6, verses 28 and 29. We're going to wrap it up right here. And then we're going to answer these questions. John 6, 28 and 29. We are talking about entering into that rest. John chapter 6, verses 28 and 29. Then saith, <clears throat> then saith they unto him, What shall we do that we might do the works of God? That we might work the works of God, do the works of God. Jesus answered unto them and said, and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on the one whom he sent. This is the work that you believe on the one whom he sent. So now we have answers to the topical sentence, is what I like to call it, to the topical verse. We have answers. What are the answers? There remaineth the rest for the people of there remaineth the rest for the people of God or to the people of God. Who is that? That's us. There remaineth the rest to us. For he that has entered into his rest, he has ceased from his own works as God did from his. What does that mean? When we get born again, we cease from trying to do everything in our own strength. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. Take my yoke and my burden. I'm the one carrying the load. He has ceased from his own works as God did from his. What works did God do? Well, the Bible says in Hebrews 4 and 3 that the works were finished before the foundation of the world. And we could get into a lot of that. But the works that he finished were the, the works of creation. And he rested. So here's my question to you. Is God moving now? God has already moved. God moved before we got here. If God didn't move, none of us would be here. Now, does he move by his spirit? His spirit does move. But God is at rest on his throne. He's not moving and he's not going to move. His spirit will move. What about Jesus? Jesus finished the work. What work did he finish? He ratified the new covenant. He came back to life to see that his will was carried out. And he ascended to seat at the right hand of the Father. Where is Jesus? He's seated. What is he going to do? He's already done. So God is seated. And Jesus is seated. That leaves one more class of people. Us. If we're supposed to cease from our own works, as God did from his, what does that mean? We're seated. The Bible says that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. A lot of times, our issue is that we keep trying to get up and do our own works and our own strength instead of trusting God to do it for us. Now, let me... Let me clarify that just a little. That does not mean that in the rest that God gave us that we don't do things by the Spirit. It means we don't struggle and strive and toil to get something done that God has already promised. God's promises for those in Him are yes and amen. We don't have to struggle to get God to do something for us. The things that we need God to do have been done. This is what the kingdom is. So what is the point here? The point is that the kingdom started in Adam. Adam fell because he took the fruit and shared it. And he lost his dominion and he lost his kingdom. So Jesus had to come by the plan of God and restore the kingdom back to man. That's what happened at the day of Pentecost. 
The kingdom is not nigh anymore. It's right here, right now. We saw it last night. Those that are here saw the two salvations and saw other things happen that are manifesting as we talk. And so I want to encourage you today. This is a message of encouragement that we need to enter into that rest on a full-time basis, not a part-time basis. We need to enter into the rest that God has already provided. We don't have to struggle. We don't have to toil. We can trust God. God has a lot of Jehovahistic names and everything he is is what we need. Amen? Everything God has provided through his son Jesus. God made the plan and Jesus carried it out. And through the Spirit, we have the power to live as sons of God and daughters of God. It says, He that has entered into his own rest, he has also ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall to the same example of unbelief. Let us labor to enter into that rest. What is that rest? The rest is believing God. The rest is having faith. That's what the rest is. Not that we don't do things, you know, that the Holy Spirit leads us to do, but resting in the knowing that God has a plan and his best plan for us is going to be carried out. If we have faith in that, it'll be carried out. God has a plan for everybody in this room. Nobody's left out of the will. Everybody's in the will. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall to the same example. The same example of unbelief. What is the same example? The same example of unbelief is what everybody went through before they believed. The same example. The same example is doubt and unbelief, unsurety, bulls and goats. But we have a more sure word of prophecy. We have promises new and better in the new covenant than we did in the old. Why? The old passed away. It's time for the new. That's why when somebody gets born again, they become a new creation. Old things have passed away. The new things have come. Do the old things stick around? They do until the person realizes who they are and what's been done for them. But I wanted to bring you a message of encouragement today because of what happened yesterday. Those two messages fit together really great. No condemnation and the kingdom. You're not condemned. You're in the kingdom. God provided the kingdom just for you. If you were the only person here, the kingdom would be for you. So we ought to get excited and we ought to praise God for what he's done and what he's provided for us. We live in the kingdom. We are children of God. We have everything at our disposal that we need. The Bible says he has given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. We're not in lack. And if today we believe we're in lack, there's plenty of scriptures that tell us as a new covenant son or daughter that we're not in lack. We have everything we need. One more thing I want to tell you, <clears throat> and then we're going to minister to some people if they need ministry, one thing the Lord showed me, um, I was about to pray, uh, I was about to, in my office and I was about to pray, and I was about to thank the Lord for open doors, and the Lord spoke to me real clear, possibly the, one of the clearest times that I believe I've ever heard. He said, do not pray to me for open doors. That might blow some people's theology away, that's okay. We all have different opinions. That's fine. We're all different. He said, I want you to look at two scriptures. 
He took me to one in Proverbs that says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. I said, okay. He said, the second one I want you to look at is Ephesians 2.10. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works that were preordained for us to walk in. The Lord said, those doors are open. The Bible says that the heavens opened and received Jesus. Where did it say the heavens closed? We live under an open heaven. The heaven is open. We have been given everything. And so today, be encouraged. God has everything that you need. Well, you might say, there's still struggles. I still go through struggles. Jesus said that we would go through trials and tribulations. But what else did he say? He said, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. Don't be sad. Don't be depressed. Don't be discouraged. Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. How do we overcome? We overcome by our faith. And we have been made overcomers through him that loved us. So today, I just want to bring you a message of encouragement and something to ponder and something to think about. The kingdom is here. The kingdom is not coming. The kingdom is here. The kingdom in every the kingdom resides in every believer. We have resurrection power flowing through our veins. We lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. We raise the dead, cast out devils, devils heal the sick and cleanse the lepers. Mark 16. Matthew chapter 10 verse 9. 7, 8, and 9. Be encouraged today. This is just for you. So that you'll know that you're a child of God. The kingdom is at your disposal, just like it was for Adam. The second Adam came back and fixed it for you. If you're not born again today, and you want to be a part of that kingdom, 